All right, peace in the pandemic. Who had a who had an interesting time through isolation? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? When things are taken away or restricted, um, I was sharing before with Bronwyn how it tends to test the reality of what's there. And that's why God allows us to go through tests. You know, he says, test to see if you're in the faith because he wants us to live lives of faith. He wants us to come into the fullness of this life in him. So it's not to prove us short. It's to show us where we're really at because he wants us to come into this full measure. So God doesn't do anything to embarrass us. Every time he shows you the reality of where we're at, it's always to build us up. It's always to encourage us. He's not that type of God. He never leaves you out there hanging. He doesn't embarrass you in front of people. He covers us, doesn't he? It was the religious people that brought the woman into the center court, and God covered her in front of everybody. And that's what I love about him. He's always covering us so we can come into the fullness of life in him. But part of the covering is to uncover us. And this is the part that can get a little bit uncomfortable because it's like, oh, what is that going to look like? I don't know what that's going to look like. And that's all a bit scary because that's about being vulnerable. But how many people know if we want this peace, we need to get vulnerable. We need to be honest. We need to get raw. You need to get real. It needs to get a little bit messy. Do you know God's okay with mess? We tend to not be. We like the polished, keeping it all together. But God's very comfortable with mess because, um, I don't know about you, birth is messy, isn't it? If you've been through the process, it's not like this nice rosy process. My hand almost got crushed. Um, I put on a song that wasn't too popular. <laughs> Danielle can't listen to that song ever now. <laughs> sort of was on repeat. Shh, turn that song off! <laughs> And so for this reality, for us to come into this peace that we're going to look at and ask these guys today, because we've all are in a measure of Christ. And really, peace is Christ. It's not Christ and peace. It's not Christ and joy. He is joy. He is peace. Now, it says that the um, kingdom of God is joy, righteousness, and peace in the Holy Spirit. So God always brings us back to this one person called his son. He loves to keep it nice and simple, eh? We tend to want to break things apart and put it into box and order it all. And he's going, what are you doing? So I'm the God of one. I keep it nice and simple. And so this morning's just to unpack and hear from these guys as they release their testimony, their reality of a peace they know, a Christ they know, through what we've all gone through. Um, so I hope you're encouraged by today um, because, you know, this was a testing time, still is a test. And as the church, we are to be a church that in tough times shine, you know. And so this is the, this is the process of maturity because we're called to lean and press into maturity. So we become a light in a dark world where our world is struggling as they're being tested by pressure. And so it's vital for us that we come into the fullness of Christ. Amen. So I'm going to start with Chris and um, just share with us, Chris, sort of your journey, experience of your health, and all those things with us. Yes, it's been a, a really interesting time. Um, I've been a Christian for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, you get to put God in a little box, if you like. And so when you come in face of a particular situation, that's, this is the formula. This is the way that you do it. But in 2015, I found that my formulas didn't work. And uh, I, uh, I started at the very beginning of 2015 with this pain uh, around the bladder area that um, got worse and worse over a period of time. And uh, I couldn't control it. And the normal things of how I pray, the normal things of all those different things just didn't seem to work. And it wasn't until I came to the end of myself, and I remember before we actually really knew what it was, I was lying on the bed and I was writhing in pain. The only way I can describe it was like a clamp, and it was getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and it would go last for an hour or two and get worse and worse and then finally subside. And it was just excruciating. And over a period of two years, it got worse. But 
I remember writhing in pain and I cried out to God. I was at the end of myself and I said, God, please take this away. And I remember just such his presence just came into that room just so powerfully. And all I heard was very clearly was, be still. Do not fear. Do you trust me? It was a pause. It was, do you trust me? Will you allow me to take hold of your hand and lead you through the process? And I remember saying, yes, Lord, I just surrender to you. And it was so powerful because, you know, his peace just swept over me. So powerfully, it was just, it's hard to describe it. It was so tangible, it was real. And his love just washed over me over and over again. And, you know, the pain didn't go away, but I was at total peace. I couldn't describe it. It was just that I was at peace. And uh, I was changed from that point onwards. And um, a week later, the elders came over and prayed for me. And I remember Greg prophesying over me exactly the same words. In fact, he had a song to go with it. And, uh, but I, I enjoyed that song. I didn't say take that song away. <laughs> but it was, it was just so powerful. A week later, they discovered a growth uh, or an ulceration in my bladder. And uh, they then were able to, I had, and to cut a long story short, four operations. Um, but, you know, in each one, and in the, throughout that time, it was like I had a different perspective. I had a different thing. I just felt like it didn't matter if God took me or if I survived or didn't survive. The fact was he was with me. And there was this underlining piece that no matter how bad it got, and it got a lot worse over a period of the 2016, that he was with me holding my hands. And I just knew that piece. It's, it was just so amazing. And um, then I had the operation. They removed the, uh, the bladder itself. And God blessed me, by the way, with amazing um, physicians right the way through. And they took... My bladder out, they uh, replaced it with the upper bowel, and they made a new bladder. It's amazing what they can do nowadays. Um, I'm now sort of going, and, and God got me through that period. And just recently, I've been going through a lot more pain, and what they think is it's sort of spread through to the, uh, the kidney area, and there's been a lot of pain around that area. Um, we don't know exactly what it is. It's inflammation. They can see it. So again, I'm going through this process of... of having to trust in him and relinquish control and that's really really important because some things are out of your hands and it's just been really wonderful because God's just shown me again over and over again that he's told me that he's never let go of my hand that promise that he gave me back in 2015 still stands today and it's just brought so much peace even though it's been physically difficult and there's a beautiful verse in um, 2 Corinthians that talks about um, even though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed. And that's the whole thing. It's, it's, I mean, our, these are tents are fading away. These tents are <laughs> falling apart. If God chooses to heal it, praise God. And if he doesn't, he is still God and he is a good, good father. And that's what he's revealed to me over that time. I've learned to be able to put my trust in him. And I think one of the most powerful things was through that, that time was I had to, I couldn't work for six months. And I tried going to work and I couldn't. As the pain got worse, I just couldn't go. And of course, I had no income for six months. But God said, let it go and let me provide. And you know, sometimes our jobs can be that thing of we hold on to everything so tightly. But over a period of six months... He provided and paid every single bill. And one of the most amazing things was a gas tank that we had that lasted usually, you know, when the kids were at home, three weeks. And then when, the, so just Sandra and me, five to six weeks. But this gas tank lasted 19 weeks without being refilled, just as I was about to go back to work. See, God's provision was so wonderful. When he said, let it go, can we trust him to allow him to do the work in us? And only when I let it go was I filled with his peace. 
So that's been the my journey, and it's just been incredible time. It's cool. Yeah. Because <clears throat> if you if you know Chris, you, he doesn't really share that he's in pain, yeah. and so he won't let you know. So ask him how he's doing. Um, but Chris, like, can you? Um, can you describe what it is within you? Can you give it words? I know it's pretty yeah. tricky because it's eternal. It's not, you know, yeah. sometimes people think peace and happiness are the same thing, like joy, they're not. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's an eternal substance, yeah. which is him. Can you, is there words yeah. to? One, one thing I've discovered is that peace is not a feeling. If we rely on our feelings, we're not going to get through this. But I discovered over, over that time that he is peace. That's what it says in... Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, he is our peace. And also in Isaiah, it talks about that he is the Prince of Peace. So really over that time, I wasn't getting to know a feeling. I was getting to know him. And he was the substance that formed a stableness within me. So I wasn't up, down, up, down, up, down. But he was there as a constant companion through that time. You know, it's funny, eh? You go through the worst of times, and yet they can be the best of times. I remember being taken to hospital in an ambulance, and it was the busiest day of the year so far back then. Um, and when you're taken in an ambulance, you don't have to wait out in the waiting room. You get wheeled straight in. And they put me in a cubicle, and it was the only one with a toilet. Now, if anyone knows, what, if you've got a the problem with your bladder, you got to go. <laughs> and I was going every five, ten minutes. That was what my day was like. And Sandra, you could hear as the curtain was closed, you could hear all the, um, the people going up and down the corridor and, and this emergency thing needed in this corridor and whatever, whatever. You know. But Sandra played this quiet worship music. And it was like I was in a different dimension. It was just so beautiful. It was just like my spirit was lifted. It was like I was in, in heaven. It was just beautiful. And I opened my eyes and I saw Sandra crying and I said, are you okay? And she said, I've just seen angels worshipping around the bed. And it was just so beautiful. But it felt like that. We, came, we went home from hospital rejoicing. It was weird. <laughs> and yet that's what life was like. It was just stable. Because he was the foundation, it wasn't a feeling. It's cool. It says here in Ephesians 4.4, 4, you know, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. And, you know, this potential that we have to receive a reality that's only found in Christ, you know, that we can know within us. You know, he's in us, but us in him brings oneness and this reality that what he went through when he went to the cross you can have in you to be able to go through trial tribulations and so often you know that's been taught in the body of christ you know that everything will go well if you're a follower you know it's almost like they should live this nice peaceful little comfortable life and it's the opposite of what i read you know it's the fact that it's the opposite. So I'm going to give you trials, tribulations. You're going to go through things. But what I do promise you is myself in you to overcome those things. So those things don't take you out. Because I'm in you, you overcome them. And there's an incredible promise for the overcomers in Revelation 2 and 3, the saints, all these same words that describe these people. Because we literally can access a substance, a source called Jesus Christ, spiritual manna which is in the kingdom of God, which is spiritual, which we can receive in us through the power of revelation, which then dictates and determines how we live on earth. It's amazing. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And if you know Chris, he is this man. He's very humble. He's very gentle. Um, so pray for him, though, because I know just even yesterday he was just having some pain again. And so, um, but God's bigger than that. As I love what you said, mate, even though he may not heal you, you know in him you're healed. You know, it doesn't mean we don't believe for prayer. It doesn't mean we don't go after prayer. But there's a peace that guards your heart and your mind that doesn't take you down dark places because you're not healed, which is awesome. The Hughes, I'm going to over, hand over to you guys. Um, just share, you know, your journey. Some people here won't know what you've been through together and Nick personally. Um, yeah, first of all, I was just thinking of um, when you were talking about overcoming things. 
um, and we are to overcome the world. And part of the world is sickness. You know, it's not just not doing the things that the worldly people do. It's overcoming all the things of this world. There's no sickness in heaven. You know, and so um, we're to overcome these things, and the only way to do that is with Christ. And um, yeah, so for me, um, it's another story parallels Chris. I think you know, I'm, I'm the bowel issues. <laughs> had bowel cancer <clears throat> last year, and um, had three operations last year. Was supposed to have two, but had three. So um, it was an interesting experience because Greg was sort of saying, you know, we have these ideas that being a Christian means everything is going to go well, everything is going to go right for us. And at times we pray and things happen and, and good stuff happens and right stuff happens and that is walking in the Lord. And I've prayed for people for healing and people have been healed. And so I was more than happy for people to pray for me and encouraged it, you know, and was expecting healing. But healing didn't come in that physical way. And um, so we had to go through some things. And every step of the way there seems to be, there seemed to be issues. You know, like we got an excellent surge and we got, all these, this provision, like Chris said, but every time there was issues, like the first surgery went wrong, you know, the, the, the second surgery went wrong, and I had to have another surgery, you know, and all these sorts of things, so you experience these things, but through all that time, you know, there, there was this underlying peace, and there was this foundation of, because of who, the person I knew, because I know peace, I know God, I was able to walk through that in a way that I believe demonstrated something of him. And so for me, it was really important that in that was to be vulnerable before my family, that they could see that, you know, and, and hear what it's like, because it's tough, but you, you move through it in a different way, not the way of the world. And... Um, yeah, I mean, there's there were times in there that like there was there was one time in particular. Now, through the the whole first um, radiation, um, the first operation, you know, all that, everything. I mean, there were blips along the way. I had I ended up with a bag, and that was done the wrong way around. And you know, they did when they manufacture, they pull tubes out of you, and they're supposed to put the tube one way around, and they put it the wrong way around, and this never happens. But <laughs> they didn't check at the hospital. I got home and they're like, oh, and the, they have a, what's called a stoma nurse who looks after you. And she said, oh, it's been done the wrong way around. So this is going to be a problem for you as long as you've got this. I'm like, oh, one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but no, we, we, we dealt with that and that was cool. But there were, there, it, wasn't, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Right through the operations and, and all this sort of stuff, it was like there was, there was this piece there was all these things. I went into the operations like chatting and laughing with the nurses and the theatre nurses and just going out to it, no problem. I have no fear. I don't fear death because I have him. And I, and I believe in eternal life. So I choose him and I choose his ways and what he thinks about things. So for me, when you don't have the fear of death, anything can happen and you cannot be shaken. You know? And so that's cool. But... So I went through this with this incredible peace, and everybody's going, oh, wow, you're doing really well. How are you doing? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm good, you know? And even when he told us it was cancer, you know, we went into a sigmoidoscopy and then a colonoscopy, these different the procedures you go through, and then he said, oh, no, we've had the test back, and it's, and it's cancerous, the growth that I had in there. I was like, oh, okay, right, what do we do? You know, and that, that was it, you know? It was, it, there wasn't something, I, I knew there was something going on as well. That was another thing, and it, like, the, I knew that I knew that there was more than what they thought it was because they didn't think it was cancer. And um, so I was prepared. You know, there was all the preparation. It's like we talked about, the, Jesus says you will have trials and tribulations. So he's preparing us there. He's been kind to us by telling us that we're going to have these things. Be prepared, yeah. you know, and being prepared is spending time with him. But anyway, there was this one, this one time where I got to the end of myself. So there was one moment in there, because I want to get real and be raw, and I told my life group all about it and that, but there was one moment, I, the, the one thing I didn't want to have to do was chemotherapy, and I was just, I just had this thing, I just didn't want to do it, and I was like, Lord, I'm not doing chemo, and I was trusting him to not have me go through chemo, and I had to make a decision whether to do it or not, and I prayed about it, and we prayed, and Joe's like, well, it's up to you, you know, pray about it, and I felt the Lord say, just continue on, like I've said, continue on going through the process, do what you've got to do, and I'm like, oh, you're kidding. But anyway, the, the night that I got told that I was going to have this chemotherapy, I, the surgeon rung me at, in, the, in the evening and I had all the stuff. I'd 
you know, this is the night that I got told by the stomachist that the bag was done around the wrong way, that it was going to be problems. There was all these different things at once. I was really weak from the operation and everything else. And I was sort of ended myself physically. And I just broke down, you know, when he told me. And it was like, oh. And it, and it was the, the lowest point of my life, you know. It was like I was sobbing hard out, I, you know, all the rest of it. I blamed God because I'd put this on God I don't want to have chemotherapy. So I thought God was not going to give, you know, make me go through the chemotherapy. And I felt, and, and then they said, you're going to have to do chemo. And I'm like, oh. And, and I was just absolutely gutted. And, and so I swore at God and I <laughs> and threw the sobs and the thing and all the rest of it. But then straight away, the Spirit said to me, I never said and I'm like, whoa. And so then it was this time of like, then, then the sobbing was because of my putting something on the Lord that he had never said. And, and I was just so, I don't know, broken and upset. And I was trying to get over the, the knowledge that I'd probably have to go through the chemo. I was repenting for putting something on the Lord that he hadn't said because we can all do that. We all make, can make God in our image and we will do this we won't have to do this, you know, we put all these stipulations on him, you know, but he says he'll be with us in the thing, so I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm. I'll fear no evil because you are with me, you know, and so in that, I ended up on the floor in the lounge, and I was an absolute mess, I was just, I was worried I was going to, like, rupture something, because I'm sobbing so hard, and I was down on my face on the floor, and it was as messy as it gets, but the reason I tell the story is because I had a vision while I was in that place, and I was falling, just falling in this darkness, falling and falling and falling and falling. I was, what's going on? And then I hit, boom, this solid rock. And it was cold, it was hard, but it was solid. Mm. And what the Lord started speaking to me was about my foundation in Christ. Everything I'd built on this foundation or that had, had been built, some of it was good and was of God, but there's stuff I'd built, some knowledge of God that wasn't necessarily him. And all that got swept away. And I had this foundation. Now, he was going to take some of those pieces and put them back up and build them, but he was going to build them how he wanted them built. So my knowledge of him was true and real, you know, not, not something that I'd made in my own mind, and it was so reassuring to hit the solid rock, and it was so firm and so solid, and it cannot be shaken. When you have Christ in your life, and you believe on him, and you believe what he says and what is written in his word, it cannot be shaken. And right through the whole time of going through it, the pain, the, you know, what, between my um, second operation and the third operation, because I had the second one, it was supposed to be the last, and then I had to have a third. I had five, you know, four or five days of, like, no food, no nothing. They had me on a drip on saline, but they couldn't give me any food until the bowel started working. But because the operation wasn't a success, there was blockages in there, there was nothing happening. So I was literally at the point of, you know, if there wasn't medical intervention, I would have died. But I was, you know, I was okay with that apart from the fact I've got a family. You know, for myself personally, it was like Paul. You know, it's, it's better to be with the Lord, but actually, in the sense of my family, it's better that I'm here. You know, there's a role for me to perform and there's, something, there's things still for me to do. So as long as there's something still for me to carry on with, the Lord will, will keep me there. But just having this foundation, this rock, and this peace that surpasses understanding allows you to go through things. And uh, other than that one really dark, deep moment, which was in turn was light because he revealed that foundation mm. and, and a few other things while I was in that moment that just, it talks about trials and tribulations. They bring about perseverance and they bring about a maturity in people. So get to the pandemic, you know, which is what we're, you know, in the pandemic. What's that? That's nothing, <laughs> you know? That's nothing. And I'm not saying it's nothing for others because that's one thing that the Lord told me in the darkness when I was in that place is what people are going through, especially with depression and these things, because of the place that I was in, it was like, he's like, this is as dark and as real and as hard 
for everybody, no matter what they're going through. They might not have gone through all these physical things and the cancer and all these things, but, you know, when people are in that place, it's so hard. So he gave me a compassion and an empathy for people that are going through mental illness and stress and depression and these things that I just didn't have before. And I was like, whoa, because I was one of these people that would just recite scripture to people and say, you know, consider it all joy through trials and tribulations, you know, <laughs> when people are going through stuff. And it's like, that's not necessarily what you need to hear. It's true, but some people aren't ready for that in that moment. I think that's the beauty of truly knowing Christ, having something to compare it to. You know, and so when you have, like Nick's saying, through going through what he went through and then something Christ being formed in, then you've got something to compare this other thing to. And that's what Paul said, compared to this, this beat, you know, Paul being beaten up, he's going, this is momentary light affliction, which is producing in me eternal glory. And the challenge is we have to have a heart and a mindset that's prepared to go through the process. Otherwise, we never come into the life on the other side of the process. So this is where it can challenge our theology, you know, and, and this whole area of healing is like, yes, we want God to heal. Yes, we believe he can, will heal. But if he doesn't and he calls you to go through, do you have that belief in God that you can trust and see and come into a posture that you wouldn't any other way but go through that. You know, and this is where we can actually miss out on an internal, eternal life being formed because we actually say, no, it's too big. We don't trust you. Must do it this way. Uh, otherwise, you know, I may not even believe you exist. Um, and so this is where he'll come, and this is part of the testing and the challenge. That's what I love about this. But I want to ask Joe what it was like for you, because obviously, you know, the two become one. And as one goes through, really, Joe, you're going through this because you're one with Nick. What was it like for you and your whole process? Yeah. Like Nick said, it wasn't easy or tidy. In fact, it was painful. It was really painful at times. Um, and as these guys have said, he doesn't always take away the hard stuff in life. Um, I was heartbroken at times. It was, it was gutting. Um, but this piece, it's not about what's happening. It's about who's with you and whatever's happening. And so it was just such the... It's Part of why it's so confounding is because it looked really messy. My emotions were all over the place. Sometimes I could hardly hold myself some, together. Um, and as a Christian, I had these ideas that it shouldn't look like that and it should be this really stoic, tidy kind of overcoming. Uh, but actually, the fact that I knew who was with me is the thing that meant I could fall apart in it because I knew that it wasn't about me. I wasn't having to hold the family together through all of this because he was. And I just um, brought this little picture because it, it goes to um, how this was for us and also to how he does know the, the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So earlier in the year, so Nick got diagnosed about this time last year. In January, I was walking down Lampton Quay and I saw a lady selling these on the footpath. What it is is a, um, a harakiki raranga weaving. And when I saw it, I was just drawn to it. I had to have it. I just knew in my spirit it was something. And I actually paid the lady who made it quite a lot more than what she was asking for it not because I was trying to be generous and bless her, but because I just knew in my spirit that this thing had value. I took it back to work, and I didn't have anywhere to put it, so I put it in my locker there and didn't think about it again until the week he was diagnosed when I was changing jobs. So I opened my locker, took it out, took it home. And look, what it is, or what it was when I bought it, is these four hand-woven flowers within this much bigger woven flower. And what it spoke to me of is that through all of this, through the ups and downs and what was a massive storm, we four, so this was Nick and I and our two kids, knitted together and hand-woven by our creator, were being held by our creator through these ups and downs of the same. These are made of the same thing in the way that Christ came to be a man with us. We are now in his family and of that same family. Um, later on in the year, we were um, 
at something celebrating Addie's fifth birthday and Hayley had made some more of these as a keepsake. And so I took one more and put it in here and that represents the fact that the family of God was with us too. So through this whole thing, we just felt so held by God and his people. Um, and that's the best way I can describe it, is this was all like this and up and down, but nothing was, nothing was getting to us that wasn't going through him. Was his presence tangible all the time? Was it, you know he's there because it's coming through other people? Like I'm just reading here, it says, the Lord is near. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I wonder, what was that for you guys? You know, because sometimes, you know, we don't necessarily sense or feel his presence. Yeah. But his presence is always near because it says it's he's near and he's faithful and he's in us. So it can't always be based on whether I feel God or not. You know, just because I don't feel it doesn't mean his, he's not absent. Yeah. What was it like for you guys as far as that? Like, th were there times when you felt his presence like he was sitting right beside you? And were there times when it wasn't that but you just knew? Yeah, both. I mean, there was one particular time which I think was where he really sealed in me how with us he was when Nick had had his first operation and was just out to it in the hospital. And honestly, there was, so Nick was out to it. My, my natural husband was out to it. There were these two chairs and it was as if Christ was in, well, Christ was there. Um, and it was in that moment that I came to understand how joined to Christ I was. It felt like, um, if you've ever been a parent sitting by a sick child's bedside as a couple, it felt like that. Um, and it was in that moment there was kind of a sealing in me of, of what it was that we were joined to Christ. Um, and that, because of what he did then, on those days where I couldn't feel it, I wasn't hearing anything, because there was quite a big period in here where I wasn't, where he wasn't talking to his people, I just knew no matter how angry I was at him, no matter how much he wasn't doing what I wanted, it was, I just knew that he was with me and with us. Yeah, I had both experiences too. It was, there were times, like I remember sitting in the hospital and, the, and they're waiting for something to move, you know, after, after the operation and that. And, um, and when, when it hadn't worked and hadn't been done right and I'm in there at two in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning on the toilet, you know, just hoping that something, praying that something would move, and I'm going for walks in the middle of the night because they try and get you to walk, to move. Just like, Lord, you know, and, and that, and I just kept saying, you are good. I know you are good. And, and, I, and I just it would keep coming back to me what Paul said, you know, when I am weak, you are strong. And I'm like, Lord, you've been strong for us. You need to keep being strong for us. You know, like Joe said, with the people coming around, it was amazing, God's people being Jesus' hands and feet, you know. But um, so in those times, you know, I, I was doped up on all sorts of medication, painkillers and all that sort of stuff. And so to experience, you know, to be in the word, to be praying, that wasn't going to happen, you know. And we, we sort of, you know, you become to rely on those sorts of things. But what I had to rely on was the foundation and the work that he had done. Mm. So there's a preparation that goes on that he wants us. That's what he's calling us into this time with him for is preparation so when things happen we have a foundation there you know and, and as much as my foundation was you know torn away at that time to the foundation of Christ and I felt I just had the foundation like the very bare justified in Christ at that point because the, all the stuff had been built and not all of it was right that foundation was enough you know, to know you're his, to know you have everlasting life, to know he is with you, whether you feel it or not. You know, there was there were many times where I didn't, couldn't sense the presence of God and I wanted to sense the presence. I'm like, Lord, just help me to sense your presence. You know, I'm here. I need something from you. And then there would just be this, it was tangible. It wasn't an, a feelings thing. It was nothing like that. But there was this, this strong thing within me that was just like, I know you're here. I know you well enough to know you are here with me. You're hearing and you're going through everything that I'm experiencing with me, you know, and I know you'll always be there. So that's one thing with walking with Christ is you're never alone. You know, on the back of my jacket, it's got the, um, the letters for you'll never walk alone. It's Liverpool's 
I think we have to do a shout out for Liverpool <laughs> <laughs> after winning the league. But, um, but that for me, I wore that because that is true in Christ. Spiritually and physically, you know, you'll never be alone. He's with you all the time. But also physically, you've got a family that's there for you all the time. One of the amazing things we saw with the community was people would come up to me, people I, you know, said hi to but don't really interact with a lot, and they'd be like, I'm praying for you. And I'm like, there, and there's, there's prayer women, most of them women. <laughs> um, and, and I was just like so touched. Sometimes I'd walk away and I'd just be, just start weeping because when certain people say they're praying for you, you know you're being covered. And we were covered. You know, I had the picture of Christ holding me and his people around covering me the whole way through. So Christ carried me. I wasn't, you know, what, Chris, you were talking about the holding of the hand. With me, it was like he had to pick me up. You know, it wasn't like I'll guide you through this. I need to carry you through this, you know. And so that, that was what I had. But anyone who's in Christ can experience that. You know, that carrying, and he will do whatever's needed for you, you know. What would you say, um, if you can probably individually, through going through the process, what's been probably the one thing you've learned about him? I was sort of hearing it, but is there one thing you could go, that's the thing that I've, you know, and, th- and that thing changes, has changed me t- in the way I live now? I think for me, it's having a knowing what it is for him to be with me, what that really is, has given me a different capacity to be with others. Mm. Yes. And by that I mean I don't have to have the answers, I don't have to have any wisdom, I can actually just be. Yeah, yeah. and I was going to say the same thing. You know, I, I already knew him, I already had this peace that surpasses understanding, and then it got to the point where it was beyond, you know, what I could walk in that taken to another level, and just the body, you know, and and his body, how he led people to do what they did, how they ministered to you, the the idea of family, you know, he's gifted us both with, um, to be able to see what the family of God is like, and it's, I feel like tearing up now because we as a body have not grasped yet what he wants for us as a body, how we should see each other, you know, and, and going through these sort of things, he gives you a compassion and an empathy for others that I'd never had. I thought I had, and I never had to go through things, because we will go through things as a family. Can we be family for one another? Because we saw people reaching out and being family, and it's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. And one of the things we were just praying into before at pre-service prayer is that God is a builder, yep. you know, and so often we think he's just, he, he's the saver of my spirit, and he is that, but he's the builder, and he builds people, you know, and he builds us into his image so that we can literally walk in the manner in which he walked. It's, you know, we, we tend to be very outcome focused as people, you know, we go, right, I need to make that happen, and what I'm hearing is this relinquishing and allowing God to truly be God, the way God intends. And when you do that, you become the recipient of God. And you come into a knowing of God within you that you can't get any other way but through that process because it's his way. But it's the relinquishing of your way to his way, and then all of a sudden there's this capacity to be with others that you couldn't be with others before because you didn't have the patience because love hadn't been formed. And yet when love is formed, now you have this compassion, you know, you, you're there. And it's not even, you're not trying to fix it, you're just there. And you walk with people. And it says in Galatians 6 that we carry one another's burdens. It's not carrying the problem, it's the brother or the sister that you're walking with. And I just heard these words, never underestimate your role in being part of the building of the body. So through prayer, oh, someone else will. Someone else, no, no, it's us, it's you, it's me, you know. And so prayer, um, and it says here, you know, the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer, you know. And it's a key that I know myself, um, in the early days, I didn't spend enough time in prayer. 
and it's something that's a priority for every one of us because it's within that that he reveals and we're able to live as he calls us to. That's awesome. Let's give these guys a hand. That was phenomenal. <laughs> Mel's written a thesis, <laughs> as Mel does, but I'm just going to turn it over to you and um, just, yeah, you just share. Me and these sort of things. Um, yeah, I I wanted to start with what peace is. I was reading in um, Colossians, but I'll just read this out because I thought this was a beautiful description. It says, um, He is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation. For through the Son, everything was created, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth all that is seen and all that is unseen. Every seat of power, realm of government, principality, authority was all created through him and for his purpose. He existed before anything was made and now everything, I love this, finds completion in him. All things, all parts, whether it's heaven or earth, man or angels, um, body or soul, it all fi- the perfect peace holds it all together. And Christ, you know, was everything we see and everything unseen is, is found in Christ. He's the, the center of it all. And so when Christ becomes the center of our lives, of our being, the circumference of our lives, what he does is he takes the whole life and he centers it as whole in himself. And so everything is made complete. Therefore, we become complete. Um, and I guess that's, to me, what peace is. But functional peace looks like living where all the parts are joined together. It's, it's being joined with him, in him, as you guys were describing both. Um, the, the oneness with him of knowing that we are tied together to the universal Christ, the cosmos Christ, um, who holds all things together in him. Um, where anxiety and worry, I guess that verse 6, you know, do not worry for anything. When you kind of know who Christ is, it's sort of, it's like, oh, that makes sense. And to be anxious and to worry actually means to divide things up and separate things. And so we, we become distracted with things in parts and we worry about things in part. But Christ reconciles all things into one. Um, And so I I guess um, a testimony I have of this peace being functional, what I mean by that is the person of Christ and how he functioned through this process was him taking every every part of, of what was going on circumstantially and bringing it all together. So um, at 32 weeks, I, um, I was... 32 weeks pregnant with my third child, and um, at, at that time she had had moved down and she was fully engaged, ready to come at 32 weeks. We didn't want her to come at that stage. Uh, so we, Kirk and I prayed, and um, we, we heard a word on Sunday that talked about, you know, um, no one wants to, to go into labor prematurely. I heard that, and we, we prayed, and I uh, went for a, a scan, and lo and behold, little girl had come up, and she had radically flipped. <laughs> so now she was sitting breech, head up, bum down. Um, this was this is my third child, so this having a, a breech position baby was was new. Um, I didn't quite understand it, um, but I had wonderful people around me who were sort of translating what this meant. Now, with that, um, it's over, over time, the skill uh, in the medical world uh, has been lost in delivering babies breech. And so, as a preemptive um, uh, measure, um, they offered something called an ECV. Now, that's when an obstetrician skillfully manipulates baby to turn, to get baby to try turn from bum, uh, from head, you know, to go down. Um, and it's, it's a very common practice uh, with, if your baby's breech. 
Um, and so this was strongly suggested. And at the time it didn't quite settle, that first conversation. But what I knew I needed to do was to go and be with my joints, my joint one, my the, the one I'm tied to, the one my life uh, is, is one with. And so that looked like a conversation uh, here and also with my husband. And through prayer, we, we felt uh, it wasn't what, it wasn't what, something we, we felt he was asking us to do. Um, and then conf- confirmation came. And it was one Sunday, again, just being with the body, all the different parts that is all tied together in Christ, reconciled in Christ. That's us. We're parts, but we're, we're whole and we're complete in him. We uh, came together and um, Joe brought a word about um, things might seem confused and upside down, but it's actually the right way up. Um, and anyway, so, so it was kind of like hearing this word in faith and then just breaking out in this response in worship, um, just praising him, you know. And in that moment, again, it's that peace where he just started speaking to me, saying, you know, um, what they're saying is upside down is the right way up in my eyes. And that actually my kingdom, the internal reality in us, seems upside down to the world. Man cannot touch from the outside and cannot manipulate an internal reality that I have placed there. So hands off. So <laughs> heard very clearly. And so at that point, that, you know, that was my peace, making peace with me. Uh, making peace with a, a part of my life of being pregnant and going through this process. Now, now the opposite of that could be getting anxious about being pregnant and about this baby being breached, and now everything is connected to this one part and missing the whole, and missing the whole complete picture that is Christ. Um, so pretty much went back to... Um, uh, the the medical team and because I had I had my own team my my cheerleading squad and uh, the, my midwife and my friend Tess who uh, at the time was a first year student midwife and um, and Kirk of course you know and so I had this team of faith that was faith induced would speak uh, words for every part of that journey I had words from the body at every part of the journey. And when it says, you know, um, don't be anxious for anything, but pray for everything, it's like this dual thing of like, don't be anxious for the parts, but pray for everything. And that's every part. And I found that every word he gave at every part of that process became a series of words that became a sentence and a declaration. And so when it came to her birth, um, because at that point um, when we said we're not doing the ECV, um, we literally walked into warfare um, on every angle. (laughs) And, you know, I love what you guys were saying. You know, peace is not the absence of war. It's not the absence of conflict. But it is the presence of faith and it is the presence of Christ. And so we don't... We don't, we're not promised happy circumstances, comfortable circumstances, convenient circumstances. What, what we do have is better, and that's the internal full completion of Christ himself that holds us together. And, you know, also that word anxious, um, it means, you know, to go to, go, to go to pieces because you are pulled apart. And I thought that is so interesting how little things can pull us apart and we get distracted where he again he holds and he ties us together as individuals and as a body um so yes it it turned into warfare and um and that's that's when things really tested the person of peace in me um but peace needed now to become functional in a sense of um the um receiving the words, um, holding holding that together in him. Um, I started getting letters from the medical world. I had to go have appointments, countless appointments, because uh, every time they were trying to convince me 
uh, that what I was doing, and they would literally say, you're, you're risking your life and your baby's life um, by not doing what we're telling you to do. Um, and so I had, to, I had to countlessly have conversations where I knew I was in the opposition. And because I'd heard a word, his word in the unseen realm, I now had to, it now positioned me in opposition. Can I just stop there and say that's the key? Okay, so if you get pregnant and your baby's breech, you don't necessarily go down Mal's pathway. Mal had a clear word from God. And that's the key, okay? Yeah, thank you for for clarifying that because ECVs are fine and are good. Caesareans are fine and good. What what God was showing me was there were two parallels running, and there's the 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 fear induced preemptive life that the flesh lives in, and there is the faith induced predetermined live by response to what I'm saying to you. That will bring opposition. That will bring, and it, he just used that context. It 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 could have looked different. I might have another baby one day, maybe. <laughs> you know, and it might be a cesarean. I don't know. It, that's not the point. The point is that he was teaching me, and actually taking me into a deeper comprehension of what true peace is. Um, and, uh, you know, right up to the birth, we were in warfare, literally on our knees in the hospital room, praying. They were trying to shift me into theatre, trying to give me epidurals to lose the art of that spirit control of yes and no. Um, and there were times that when, when I received this letter that was really strongly worded about who I was and how firm I was standing against them, which wasn't the case. It was against the the power and principality that was trying to draw me in to be controlled and manipulated when I knew what the word had said, the word of peace had said to me. And so in labor, even while in labor, you know, I'm having these contractions and still trying to tell the, the top dog that we're, we're not going this way. Um, you know what was amazing was in that moment, he because he, it was Christmas Day, very inconvenient for everyone. It's probably why people were so mad as well. <laughs> but we had people coming in and out, and he came from from home, so you know he was dressed nicely, but he was he was not happy with me. And he walked out. We prayed. My midwife went, amazing, became a mediator between this man and us, as a peacemaker, and went on my behalf to speak the medical terms and to be, and a translator. He came back in and he was in white scrubs and his whole countenance had changed. It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, you know, and then at that point, Tess, Tess uh, spoke a word that the Lord had spoken to me before um, about raw, like now is the time you need to raw and just stand upright and speak and declare what you've you've heard. Um, there was also a word on circles. And um, two weeks earlier, I had a, a group of women come and we were just praying together. And one of my friends literally um, encircled me and Tess, like in warfare, you know. And uh, two weeks later, at that time, I'm in labor. And it's like, it's this warfare. And we just, we just knew it was this encircling and surrounding of Christ, you know. Um, just lastly, with um, the, the birth, they finally accepted and said, if we do this your way, Rayma, my baby, has to, she has to turn at certain angles at certain times. Um, it's like there has to be things fulfilled perfectly. And if she doesn't, then we're taking over and we're going to cut you open. And so it was like, okay. You know, um, and so we did. We let it be. I trusted this was a, a hands off, and um, Rayma did the perfect work. She she just absolutely fulfilled, did the beautiful um, the beautiful birth, and a uh, little bum out first, head later. And what was beautiful was, you know, I thought I thought I was going to have this lovely home birth before his breach. I was like just quiet and wonderful, <laughs> and I was actually just part of a home birth where it was just incredible um, but I landed up being in a hospital with 12 people surrounding my bed some looking on like curious to see if this was actually going to happen others were quite 
you know, frustrated. I had one midwife who, uh, probably the rudest encounter I've ever had, like walked into the room, just looked at me. I said, oh, hello, you know, it's Christmas. Hello. <laughs> and um, she just straight out ignored me. And um, it, it, we found out later that she, you know, she was the one who was uh, setting up the theater room for me. And then the fact that we didn't use it was like a waste of her time and staff and <laughs> all the rest of it. But um, interesting enough, Outside of that, we uh, people we know met her for the first time. They asked, oh, were you um, Christmas Day part of a delivery suite with a breech birth? Oh, yes, I was. Okay, interesting. Um, and she, she uh, opened her heart to God and prayed and, uh, with her partner, which was the mutual friend, and apparently asked him into his life. And amazing, her name means righteous <laughs> and justice. And I thought, wow, wow. And so, yeah, I guess the, the series of words through, through the stages of this process was him reconciling it all. And like I said, the series of words created a sentence. And that was the declaration in the hospital room. And to my, to my soul and to the powers and principalities that I had moments where I was on my knees, literally not praying anymore to the Father, but shouting out to the powers and principalities that this is happening. Not my will, his will is happening anyway, whether I'm like freaking out or not, you know. So, um, but it was a declaration and that was that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that's what Rama means, so. It's very cool. Thanks, Phil. I'm just aware of the time, um, but just do want to open it up if we've got maybe a couple of questions that you want to ask these guys, because I'm hoping what you're hearing is a reality that we can all know, and a, and a reality that's in a person that we can all know and be guided by, you know, it's not just words on a page, These the, the words are spiritual words that men and women who have had this reality have written, so men and women have encountered Christ and write a reality that we as Christ-like people can know, and so what I'm hearing is a realm, a realm and a reality that we can actually have within us that also guards us as we go through what we're going to go through. So has anyone, maybe a couple of people, anyone got a question you'd like to ask these guys? <coughs> Rochelle's got a mic, so maybe just put your hand up. She'll come run, speak into the mic so everyone can hear you. She won't run, she'll walk. <laughs> you got a question, Vera? Yep. <laughs> All right. I won't leave you alone, eh? Okay, so what I'm getting is, um, so the stories we're hearing here are testimonies to the Lord and they are a prophetic picture. I know that Greg said that before, but they are prophetic pictures for the last days and you know how we're here um, and it's not an accident that each of us is here. And we are being deliberately birthed into such a time. So, um, so when somebody is speaking, my heart races because I know the Lord is speaking to us through these stories. And I just want to say something about Mal's testimony in that birth. Now, for years I kept having this dream of circles and... That will become clearer later, but we haven't got a lot of time. But now, one of the dreams I had well before Rhema arrived on the scene was the Lord in the dream um, with me coming through the birth canal and I was in breach position. Now, I represent church because I'm you, you are me. And as I come down this birth canal... It's very speedy. It's like fast. And I'm going, oh, okay, I've never had a breach birth, but this is a spiritual message that the Lord is trying to convey and communicate. 
And as I come through the birth canal, it's pretty fast, and I land on my feet. And the words that come with this prophecy is hitting the ground, running. And then <laughs> when I hear Mal's journey, now if Mal's the daughter, you know, she's my spiritual daughter. Her and I have this odd connection. Now, when she went through this journey, like a mum, you want to say something and you want to protect her from, you know what she's going to go through, you know. Um, but you just know that the Lord, through her life, is going to demonstrate something. So this resonates with me, this journey of hers just resonates with my spirit because this is what the Lord is doing. The journey of a life that is yielded to God so God can speak through it. And that generation, the birth is symbolic of what the Lord is doing. There's acceleration. These are the last of the last days. Your children, the children that are birthed in that generation, Mm. there's something that they carry and you watch them, just observe them. They come out with the wisdom of God. They come out living in that kingdom mentality, that kingdom wisdom. They carry that stuff that I've had to learn for years. It's already in them. And there's this acceleration. So the birth demonstrates that. You know, there's an acceleration of what God is doing. And he's just asking us, will you turn? Will you turn? Will you pay attention to what I'm doing? There's more, but we haven't got time. So that's all I have to say. And I just thank him. Thank him that through these lives we can see his love demonstrated and how much he wants to be with us, you know? How much he wants you to be a part of what, he's, what he is, who he is. Mm. He wants us all to become who we've been predestined to become, yeah? Mm. And it's us, us discovering who we really are and his purpose for us as a people. Mm. Sina, did you have a question? And we'll wrap up. Thank you for all speaking our Father's heart. But I do have a question to all of you. You all mentioned that you heard from the Father the one word, and that's what you stood on to go f to move forward from it. Can you all uh, try your best to expand a, a bit more on that? And how did you know it was definitely Him? And there was, there was no, is it him? Is it, yeah. It, can you, yeah, try your best to explain it. Thank you. Okay, that's great. For me, because it was so instant, um, when, when I was in pain, your thoughts are on the pain. Your thoughts are on what you're going through and things like that. So you can have this real grounded... Um, Thing you're not thinking really of above or anything like that. You're just think, focusing on the pain. So when those words came to me, be still, do not fear, it cut across everything that I was going through. And so I knew it was him. I didn't doubt or, f or, or think, did I or didn't I, d that it was him. I just knew it because when I surrendered, I felt that peace. That peace it was... It wasn't of this world. It wasn't. It wasn't. Ten, I mean, it wasn't something that was um, made up. It was so tangible and real that I just knew it was. And not only that, sometimes God confirms it. And as I said, a week later, Greg and the elders came over and prayed for me, and Greg prophesied the same words. So it was like God just stamping his seal, saying, "This is my word." Um, yeah, I think for me, <coughs> it was being confirmed through the body, um, just different, yeah, just different words where my spirit just, just responded, you know, and then it was 
um, in responding to what I heard, it's like that faith is stirred up to, it builds the momentum and it becomes this groundswell. And so it's, it's, it's like you're in labor. I feel like when the word is um, enlarging itself in you, it's like you're pregnant. And then um, it, it reaches this climax and then you just want to pop, you know. And then it's like, right, I've got to give birth to this now. And it's about to demonstrate the very thing it's speaking of. Yeah. So again, there's this pattern of confirmation, but I find with me when he really speaks like that, I can be a bit bat chatty and what about this, what about that? There's just this kind of um, sword that goes down and it just cuts off any argument. And there are a few of these. There was one I felt to share, but I couldn't because it was about our daughter and she was here and she'd be cross. <laughs> I will now. Um, where we were in the car, um, he was having his radiotherapy, and I was praying with her, dear Lord, please heal daddy, please let him don't have to have all these other treatments. Amen. And I said to her, um, oh, dad might be healed now. And she said, but he's not. And I said, but why not? God can, God can do anything. He could have healed daddy. And she said, um, yeah, he could, but he wants to teach us something. And I said, what does he want to teach us? And she said, to be calm. And it was just one of those words from the mouth of babes where it was just like, <laughs> and we just <laughs> sat in silence for the rest of the way home. Um, just got um, school. Exactly. Um, and so to me, A, that came through the body. It came through someone else and was confirmed. But to me, there's always just this sense of sharpness that shuts my mouth, basically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I experience times sometimes where the, the word is just, you just know. You know, I mean, most of the time, like I said before, going through what I was going through, when you're on the medication and stuff like that, it just messes with your head and you're just in this fuzziness and I couldn't pray, you know, I, I was struggling to pray, I couldn't read the word, I couldn't, you know, do these things that I'd normally go to and that, that's when I was, I was resting in what I knew of God, so most of it for me was resting in what I knew of him and so even the simple things of he is good and resting in that. And then there were times where we had to make decisions like whether to do the chemo or not. Even though they'd said I needed to do it, there was an option for me not to do it. And I didn't want to do it. So everything in me physically was crying out for, don't do this. And then I heard this voice say, carry on, keep going through with it. And I'm just like, oh, you're kidding. And you want to second guess it, but you know. You know, it's, it's that voice that just comes through and it's authoritative but it's gentle and it just says what you actually know, but maybe you don't want, you know? And so you, what, you can fight against it, but I just resign to the fact that if he says it, you know, we, Joe and I just sat down the last minute, which is like, well, we have to pray. And she's like, well, it's up to you. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what do we do? And he said, keep on going. And I'm like, oh, looks like we're going through, <laughs> with it, you know? And that was just it. So, yeah. And I think the key is is the development of your own relationship, your own fellowship with Christ, the Holy Spirit, yeah. you know, because it can sound so simple. Well, we, well I heard was, well, we just know. Mm. Well, that's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Yet it is yeah. when you know. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and that's why the world looks and says, well, that, what's that? That's wisdom. You know because you know. Yeah. It's like when you know someone and they call you, you know their voice. Yeah. You don't have to say anything. You know because you know. And so I, if there's anything I can encourage us with, it's, you know, God says, I'm a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. What you get is the knowledge of God because you're seeking God, which takes time. I just want to thank you guys for being open here. Yeah. And if... If you're with us for the first time, I hope you've enjoyed it. We are a family that just want him.